Hi guys. Yo, I'm so excited. Today we have a very special guest. Cassie calls her my imaginary friend, but she is real. Meet my friend and our producer, Jeanette. Hey guys, I'm Jeanette. Or am I? Maybe I'm just an oh. actress. Maybe I'm not. Who knows? Great. Even you're on Cassie's side. Well, I'm Andrea, and this is Morbidly Captivating. Today, we're asking, how well do you know your significant other, your family members, and your friends? <laughs> Are they genuine? Are they superficial? Are you seeing them for who they really are? Or are you seeing the person you want them to be? Or the person they want you to see? Are they the same person now that they were when you met them? Or have they changed? Not knowing can be deadly. This is the case of Robert William Fisher. Late in the evening of April 9, 2001... A 10-year-old boy, his 13-year-old sister, and their 38-year-old mother were murdered while sleeping peacefully in their beds. Then, their ranch-style home began to slowly fill with natural gas. The following morning at 8.42 a.m. on Tuesday, April the 10th, the Scottsdale, Arizona home exploded. The explosion caused the front brick wall of the home to collapse. For a half a mile in all directions, neighboring houses were rattled. Within minutes, firefighters were on the scene. They were faced with a 20-foot high blaze, but miraculously, they managed to keep the flames from spreading to neighboring houses. As if the intense fire wasn't enough to keep the firefighters cautious, they were forced to keep their distance due to a series of smaller, secondary explosions believed to be either rifle ammunition or paint cans. One firefighter suffered minor injuries to his leg when he lost his balance and fell near the burning house. I have to wonder, does rifle ammunition blowing up sound different than a paint can blowing up? That's a I good mean, question. I've never really heard it. Well, I've heard gunshots go off from a fire, but it's like pop, pop, pop. Would a paint can be a bigger pop? You would also think maybe if it was ammunition, it would be lots of little pops, right? I mean, you're not just going to have one bullet. right? It'd be like a box of bullets, right? I would think. Do you have a box of paint cans? If you have a box, that means you need to get busy. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a honey-do list a mile long, right? <laughs> Once the fire was under control, officials conducted a search for bodies and discovered the charred remains of Mary, Brittany, and Bobby Fisher. Their throats had been slit. But where was the patriarch of the family, Robert Fisher? Hmm. Well, just like we're asking the question, William Cooper immediately defended his son-in-law, Robert, as journalists, like us, began reporting on the murders and questioning Robert's whereabouts. William was distraught over the murder of his daughter and grandchildren, though he could not believe that Robert was capable of committing such a heinous act. He was worried that Robert may have been camping or hunting and totally unaware of what happened to his family. Worse still, William worried that he may have been kidnapped which is possible. During televised interviews, William pleaded for him to return, but Robert was nowhere to be found. Robert Fisher was born in Brooklyn, New York, to William Fisher and Jan Howell. William and his two sisters were raised in Tucson, Arizona. In 1976, Robert's parents divorced. He was 15 years old, and according to friends and relatives, the divorce was extremely difficult on him. William got custody of Robert and his two sisters. After that, Robert joined the Navy after graduating from Saguaro High School in 1979. He aspired to become a Navy SEAL, but he didn't make it. Instead, he served as a petty officer second class on the San Diego-based USS Bella Wood from 1979 to 1982. 
After Robert completed his service in the U.S. Navy, he became a firefighter in rural San Diego County, California. William said Robert met Mary through a Baptist church social group while Robert was a firefighter, and then they got married. However, Robert injured his back, and that ended his career. So the couple relocated to Scottsdale, Arizona. <clears throat> New beginnings, right? Robert began an associate degree program in 1986 at Gateway Community College in Phoenix. He and his wife purchased a three-bedroom ranch-style home near Mary's parents for 80000 in 1987. I wish house prices were that low now. <laughs> no joke. Me too. I mean, I'm not sure I'll ever own a home again with the market like it is now. We've been looking for three years. Well, you might be able to get one, but it may not be on the right side of town. Or it's definitely not going to be at that kind of a price. He went to work at Mayo Clinic Hospital as a surgical catheter technician and as a respiratory therapist. Okay. <laughs> Those two positions are not really related. Talk about working on opposite ends of the body. <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm going to ignore that. I don't want to get into a discussion on, uh, let's say, bodily functions. You're right. Let's move on. In 1988, their daughter, Brittany, was born. Three years later, Robert Jr., known as Bobby, was born. Robert was a proud father, and he kept videotapes of their birthday parties in his gun safe. Robert and Mary appeared to be a model family. Their life revolved around church activities, in which Mary participated more than Robert, and camping, quad riding, hunting, and fishing, those were Robert's passions. He was an avid sportsman. He owned at least four rifles, one shotgun, one pistol, and three hunting knives. It's pretty and normal. And a hunter. Bear tree. <laughs> right. He had a concealed weapon permit for a thirty eight caliber revolver, which one neighbor said he habitually carried in a specially made fanny pack. Nice. Robert's friends said there weren't any neighbors he didn't get along with. They said they never saw him let his emotions get out of control or even on the verge of it. One neighbor, Don Kubander, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Don, um, said if there were problems in Robert's life he hadn't noticed, Robert lifted weights at World Gym in Scottsdale. Paul Mueller lifted weights with him and found him easy to talk to. He was walking the walk of a Christian, Mueller said. It wasn't a convenience item. At home, however, Robert was very controlling. In fact, you could say domineering. For example, Mary was not able to decorate the home as most wives do. Robert didn't allow Mary to hang pictures, regardless of what it was, including their children's artwork. He, on the other hand, hung his mounted elk and fish and anything else he wanted. Well, Robert's mother told investigators that she was a yes-sir wife who didn't stand up to her husband. She added that she saw similar dynamics early in her son's marriage to Mary and had talked to her daughter-in-law about her concerns. One close friend of Robert stated that his family resembled Fisher's childhood family. Robert confided to one associate at the Mayo Clinic Hospital that his life could have been different if his mother hadn't left the family. William's wife, Jenny Cooper, told investigators that her son-in-law didn't socialize often with family because of a fear of getting too close to people and losing them. Robert's attempt to control Mary was his way of preventing her from leaving him the way he felt his own mother had. Though Robert's friends tried to paint him as a model father, Robert's demons not only made him a cruel and distant control freak who was awkward with his children, but he also displayed disturbing behavior while on hunting trips and other outdoor occasions with his friends. Robert smeared the blood of an elk that he had killed on his face. It was reported that on at least one occasion that Robert emptied his gun into the air after sneaking up behind a family that was picnicking. Consequently, his friends no longer went on outings with him. I mean, I couldn't imagine. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go. I kinda, wouldn't be going. It reminds me of that movie Red Dawn, which my husband loves to watch all the time. There's a scene in there where a couple of the guys, you know, they're out in the woods totally different storyline but they're out in the woods with a deer and they talk one of the guys into drinking the blood 
Ew. you know and then they're like well how did it taste and he, he's like you know and they're like no we don't <laughs> uh I absolutely don't. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I don't know people who go and put animal blood all over themselves just because they're a hunter. Like, that's not normal behavior. Not for me. <laughs> not for me. Not for me either. Within the confines of his own home, Robert and Mary routinely argued. Neighbors reported hearing screaming from the Fisher home every night around 10 p.m. Wade Renscock a former neighbor said, and I quote, they did not have a happy marriage. They screamed constantly. Everybody heard it. You could hear it in the house next door. You never really heard him scream, which is kind of weird. I mean, he had a way about him, but you never heard him scream. You always heard his wife screaming things like, you're worthless. I could have done better than you. We should get a divorce. Mary's sister, Myrna Beitzer, said, quote, Robert told my dad often that divorce was not an option. He would not be divorced like his parents were. Robert stated that several times. Robert apparently suffered deep emotional scars after the divorce of his own parents, and he was determined that his children would not experience the same emotional pain. According to psychologists, an intense fear of loss is not unusual for an individual traumatized by divorce while still an adolescent. Investigators learned that there had been tension between Robert and Mary following the back injury that ended his career as a firefighter. Fisher told his co-workers about a one-night affair with a prostitute he met in a massage parlor. Imagine that, the walk of a Christian. Right. He worried that Mary would find out that it was the cause of a urinary tract infection that left him ill for several days. Needless to say, the tension between Robert and Mary heightened when he told her about the affair. In fact, Mary was shattered and she asked Robert to leave. I mean, I guess it's a thing that you think your actions don't have consequences and you can just do whatever you want and everybody has to do what you say. But that's not the real world. Robert headed north to the forest where he usually went to hunt. Despite their marital difficulties, he vowed that his marriage would never dissolve. He told a hunting mate that he was renewing his commitment to his faith and his marriage because he could not live without his family. About six months before Fisher's family was gruesomely murdered, people noticed a change in him. Most notable was his withdrawal from church activities and his absence from the gym. Four days before his wife and children were killed, Robert spent the afternoon doing chores. He changed the oil in his well-cared-for and fully paid-for 2001 Dodge Ram 2500 Cummins diesel pickup. Then he shopped for attic insulation, carrying out routine errands as though everything was picture-perfect. In the weeks before her death, Mary told several friends that she was going to divorce Robert. According to a neighbor of the Fisher family, the couple had a large argument on April 9th, 2001, at about 10.30 p.m. Investigators theorized that Robert murdered each one of his children and then his wife. He slashed their throats from ear to ear. In addition to cutting his wife's throat, he also shot her in the back of the head. In an attempt to cover up the murders, Robert disconnected a natural gas line from the furnace. Nearby, and completely out of place, was a candlestick holder. Finally, Robert doused the house with gasoline. With the gas slowly filling the house, it would give him time to gather together his clothes and the family dog and leave. Robert left in his wife's car while his beloved truck remained parked in the carport. Detective Kirkham describes the situation as, quote, As a source of ignition, we believe that a candle with a candle holder was used as a timing device in order to allow Robert time to leave the residence. Robert committed the arson in order to cover the murders. Believing that the bodies would be burned beyond recognition, covering up any sign of what happened. But it didn't cover it up quite as well as he expected. Most people think that the body, when cremated, is set on fire. But this is one of the most misguided cremation myths. 
The cremation process uses flames to create extreme heat in a specially designed furnace. The furnace reaches temperatures of around 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Since the human body contains 65% water, all of that water must be vaporized for the body to combust. There's your science for today. (laughs) I want to be cremated. I don't want a boring funeral. I just want a simple service, remembering how fun and weird I am. I'd like for Nerf guns to be put under each seat, but probably the funeral home wouldn't like the big mess of those foam bullets laying around. I don't know. You think they'd charge extra for having to pick all that up? I don't know. I, cremation is not for me right now. I, um, I used to want to be degrees put is into pretty hot. Whether your yeah. soul is there or not. <laughs> <laughs> you're like afraid you're gonna know your feet are in the fire <laughs> well you know i'm not sure i want to watch my show burn either <laughs> well, i mean you know we don't know what happens after we die and so we we don't know uh i used to want to be put in like dirt i guess still once i'm cremated you could put my ashes in the dirt and then plant a tree on top of me like an apple tree would be ideal because then i can be productive after death and not just <laughs> something pretty but i'm not i'm not sure too many people want to eat those apples so i'm fine if it, if it's just an ornamental shrub <laughs> but like save the environment you know guys this, this is absolutely morbid right i mean we live up to our expectations right well i mean our name is morbidly captivating if they haven't figured it out by now i don't know what to tell them we call that for a reason. <laughs> right. Neighbor Don Kubander was led to ask, quote, why would he have bothered with the pickup and home improvements if he had anything like that planned out? Then comes a truly horrific question. How could an entirely ordinary person, who I find it kind of funny that he calls himself a Christian, could have brought himself to shoot his wife in the head and slit his children's throats. Fisher's older sister, Carol Jackson, said, quote, We don't know what happened or why it happened. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always a mystery when somebody kills somebody else, especially so cold and methodical like that. I mean, you can kind of understand it when it's a crime of passion and it's instant, you know, that they just lost control of their emotions. But this cold and calculating, to me, it's like, it's like he went about his day totally normal to throw people off so they wouldn't think it was him. I mean, that's the only explanation that I can think of. I'm sure there, that our listeners will come up with better ideas. But in my mind, that's why he acted so normal. But I think the bigger picture is, where did he go? How could he be a cold-blooded murderer And then just morph back into a normal law-abiding citizen. If he had committed another similar crime, surely he would have been connected back to this case. I mean, it reminds me of List, like where John List suffered from financial difficulties. So he murdered his entire family, except, except if self, of course, they never take themselves out. No, they go on to live long, normal, mundane lives. John List was finally found years later, just living like any other Joe Blow, random neighbor. You know, he never killed again that we know of, so it was more like he wanted out of his responsibilities the cowardly way. Yeah, his his neighbors turned him in after he was featured on America's Most Wanted, and he was apprehended that way. Too bad that hasn't worked yet in this case. Um, We should cover that case sometime. That's a pretty good idea. I think we'll put it on our list. I see what you did there. (laughs) I know, it was really (laughs) cheesy, wasn't it? On April 14th, 2001, Robert William Fisher was named as an official suspect when the Arizona Department of Public Safety officers were instructed in a statewide bulletin to arrest him. It should be noted that even now he is the only suspect. On April 20th, 2001, the last physical evidence of Fisher's whereabouts surfaced when police found his wife's 2000 Toyota 4Runner 
and the dog Blue in the Tonto National Forest, a hundred miles north of Scottsdale. Authorities thought they had Fisher cornered in the wilderness northeast of Young when they found Mary's SUV and the dog, which was near Fisher's favorite hunting area. Detective Kirkham said, quote, It was clean. There was no dust on it. You know, it was underneath pine trees, and there were very few pine needles on top of the vehicle or in the vehicle, which indicated to us that it had probably been dumped there within 24 hours of discovery. Investigators rushed to the remote area, but the landscape was riddled with hundreds of caves. They searched for days, but didn't find Fisher or any other sign of him other than the SUV. Two theories emerged from that fruitless search. The first was that a despondent Robert Fisher took refuge in one of the caves where he eventually committed suicide. Mm, I don't know if I'm buying that. The other theory suggested that a cunning Fisher left the SUV behind to divert the attention of investigators and then vanished. Robert's sister, Jean, is left to wonder what became of her brother. Where could he be? Where could he have gotten to where he would be? He didn't take any money with him, and he would be in so much physical pain from his back. I don't know if he did this. I don't know how he could be alive, knowing how much my brother loved his family. It kind of sounds like somebody's in denial. Mm, For real. Mary's sister, Myrna, also believes that Robert is alive. If Robert wanted to kill himself, he would have done it when he killed Mary, Brittany, and Bobby. That's my belief. So I do believe Robert is alive. Detective Kirkham believes Fisher is still alive, stating, The vehicle itself was about a quarter of a mile off the Improved Forest Service Road. It's a fairly active area with a lot of traffic. And there are various places that one could use a phone, catch a ride, that sort of thing. He's probably started a new life under an assumed identity. An Arizona Superior Court state arrest warrant was issued in Phoenix on July 19, 2001. Fisher was charged with three counts of first-degree murder and one count of arson. He was declared a fugitive and a federal arrest warrant was issued by the United States District Court for the District of Arizona. The warrant charged him with unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. The television show America's Most Wanted featured Robert Fisher in August of 2001. The Arizona Republic said federal documents show a call was placed to the tip line by Fisher from a pizza parlor in Chester, Virginia on August 18, 2001, one week after the story aired. Police didn't reveal what the man claiming to be Fisher said, why he called, or even how long he talked. Scottsdale Police Detective John Kirkham said, There were some things that led me to believe it was Robert Fisher. He said the call was the first, but not the only piece of evidence that eventually allowed the FBI to officially join the hunt six months later. He also said that the Scottsdale police have received about 365 leads in the case, but the phone call was the first, and so far, only one from anyone claiming to be Fisher. The FBI joined the hunt for Fisher in February 2002, when a federal warrant for his arrest was issued on suspicion that he had fled the state. On June 29, 2002, the FBI named Fisher as the 475th fugitive to be placed on the top 10 most wanted list. He's also on the America's Most Wanted Dirty Dozen, list of the show's most notorious fugitives. The FBI is offering a reward of up to $100,000 for information leading to his capture. We should make sure to tell our listeners to call in tips to us so we can get that reward. Absolutely. (laughs) I think they'll go for it. The FBI had received hundreds and hundreds of leads as of April 2003. In February 2004, an individual with a very similar physical resemblance to Robert Fisher was arrested in Vancouver, British Columbia by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. According to the Surrey Leader, a publication in British Columbia, Canada, 
Surrey and White Rock RCMP, reacting to a tip of a man resembling Fisher, surrounded a home at uh, 14553 Sunset Drive just before 4 p.m. After shutting down streets in the area, the RMCP's emergency response team crept through blackberry bushes in Dupre's Ravine, signaling neighbors to keep quiet and ordering them to remain inside their homes. Police were tipped by someone surfing the internet who found the fugitive's photo on a government website. Fisher, considered armed and extremely dangerous, is described as 42 years old, 6 foot, 190 pounds, with brown hair and blue eyes. He is known to have a noticeable gold crown on an upper left tooth and chews tobacco. While the likeness between the suspect and Fisher were uncanny, it wasn't him. Dental records and fingerprint records were used to determine whether or not they were one and the same. Over ten and a half years later, on October 11, 2014, another sighting was reported, this time in Colorado. While it did lead to the arrest of two men, neither was Robert Fisher. Robert Fisher would currently be 60 years old. Please check out our website for pictures and the FBI poster. If you notice someone that appears to be Robert Fisher, please contact us so we can pass along the info to the Scottsdale Police Department at 480-312-5000 and the FBI Phoenix Division at 623-466-1999. We need justice for this family. Yes, it's so sad that he hasn't been captured yet i mean i guess there is the possibility that he committed suicide or died by more natural causes due to an accident out in the woods or in one of the caves but it's equally possible that he's just living his best life like john list was so how'd you like your first episode awesome so you had fun i did i might have to make another appearance you might So I want everyone to say a big thank you to Jeanette for joining us today. Uh, Make sure to check out our website, YouTube, Twitter, where else are we? Instagram, Facebook, all those places. You know where to find us. You've been stalking us long enough. That was great. Thanks for listening. We'll arrange payment later, okay? (laughs) 